Good morning and welcome to the Core Connection. I'm Mira Rubin here with you on Enlightened World Network. And today's topic is the pitfalls of perfectionism, which should be a lot of fun, uh, should be an interesting conversation. We often laud perfectionism as something to strive for when in fact it can be pretty crippling. So before we get started, uh, having that conversation. Let's just take a minute or two to get present. Let's take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. And imagine clean, crisp oxygen flooding your lungs, flowing into your bloodstream, nourishing all your cells, all your organs, bringing vital life energy to your body and being. And as you exhale, exhale any tension, stress, negativity, fatigue, and now let's take another deep breath in through your nose and hold it. This time, imagine brilliant bright light lighting you up from the inside out, illuminating, electrifying, and energizing all your cells, your molecules, your electrons, creating a brilliant beam of light and energy from your heart out into the world. And as you exhale, Exhale any remaining tension, stress, negativity, fatigue. And now let's press our palms together. Vigorously rub your hands together to feel the friction, the tickling, the tingling, the pressure, the motion, all the sensations that can bring you present right here, right now, into this remarkable physical form that enables you to experience life. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, Rosalind. Good morning to everybody else who's joining us. So good to have you here with us. And we're talking about the pitfalls of perfectionism. And, you know, we talk about, well, I'm a perfectionist and I'm a recovering perfectionist by my own admission. So um, I this is a topic that is dear to my heart. And um, what I know about my experience with perfectionism is that it was an impediment as much or more than it was a benefit for me um, and something that enabled me to not do a lot of things, not even try to do th certain things because I didn't have the assurance that I would be able to do it well, or I knew that I wouldn't be able to do it excellently, or I knew that there were people who could do whatever it was better than I could, and therefore it stopped me from even trying. So there's a paralysis that can come along with perfectionism that really deeply impedes us from engagement even from even attempting to do certain things and um, what goes hand in hand with perfectionism I think and this is an important thing to note is a level of judgment whether it's self-judgment or judgment of others you know it's sort of looking at all the things that that are not perfect, sorting for what's not perfect. Good morning, good morning, good evening, Gia, welcome. It's so good to have you here with us this morning. Um, we are talking about the pitfalls of perfectionism and perfection paralysis. Uh, so what can happen so easily is that We, we narrow our focus with perfectionism. Now there are certain areas where perfectionism is important. Like if you're working in a nuclear facility, you want to make sure that everything is meticulously handled, right? Um, and properly handled. But with most of life, perfection, first of all, is is a concept. Let's talk about what, what perfection actually is. 
It's a concept. It's an idealization of something and a projection of that idealization, right? And something that is idealized is very often something that's inachievable, right? So it's an expectation that we're projecting outward. And then based on that expectation, we're measuring reality. And reality rarely measures up to whatever that idealization is. Gia says, running behind perfectionism in itself is calling for stress and unreal expectations of yourself and others. Exactly, exactly. So what happens with perfectionism is we create this ideal and then we try to force reality to um, comply with whatever that ideal is. So we can look at that even in the context of relationship, you know, where we have this idea of the perfect person, the perfect mate, and then uh, we measure everybody that we meet against this ideal. And fact of the matter is, that's an ideal, it's a construct. And whatever the expectation is that we've created, it's unlikely that reality is going to serve that expectation fully, right? Um, what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about mostly this morning is perfectionism in terms of expectations of our own performance or the performance of others around us. And uh, it's it's been an interesting training ground for me, the um, my work with sustainability now that uh, my partner, my business partner, Scott Billy and I um, started, where both our lives are very, very busy. And we do what we do for sustainability now as really an act of love. You know, it's, it's really just, it's a contribution and it's something that we squeeze into our very busy lives. And oftentimes things get lost in the sauce, so to speak, and, and um, mistakes are made like regularly, you know, whether it's with an email or with a posting or, you know, with scheduling, there are mistakes that happen all the time, like with great regularity on, on both our parts. And there was a time in my life that when I made a mistake, it was a devastating experience it just would level me like, because I made a mistake. It was like the world was coming to an end. And now what I notice, and, and maybe you know we can call this resilience perhaps, but what I notice is that when a mistake is made, we just correct it. You know, we, we address it. And it's like, oh, okay, made a mistake. Let's go fix it. It happens. And um, yeah, it happens with some regularity because both of us are very distracted with other demands. And yet what's happening is that we're still able to create what we're creating and generate an impact and create benefit for others. And okay, it's not perfect. It's not, the fact that it's not perfect is not diminishing the benefit that we're able to create or the contribution that we're able to create. And so imperfect action, this is, this is something that I have been, as I said, being schooled in over the past number of years actually, is um, to take, that it's better to take imperfect action 
than to be sure that everything is perfect. Um, what, what do they say? Um, better to ask forgiveness than permission in this situation it's kind of the same thing you know is to uh better to keep keep the momentum going keep the emotion in motion without the paralysis that comes with perfection you know trying to like develop a course so i'm in the process of developing a course and if I allowed myself to be deeply influenced by the need for perfection, that would actually prohibit me from doing anything probably because I would keep tweaking it forever. I would keep trying to refine it and test it and whatever and in endlessly until it were perfect and the thing is that perfection again and it's so important for us to recognize perfection is a construct we're we're the ones that are defining this thing that by definition pretty much is unachievable you know it, it, it's perfection is judgment so Rosalind says self-help treadmill. Thank you, Rosalind. That I love that. I'm seeing, I'm seeing images of that. So um we we if, the self-help treadmill actually makes me think about how for so much of my life I really experienced myself as broken rather than whole or fractured, but really broken. And part of that, as I'm looking at it in this moment, part of that was my indoctrination to this notion of perfection, because I grew up in an environment where nothing was good enough. That's also a side effect of perfectionism, right? because nothing measures up to that manufactured ideal, right? So with perfectionism, nothing, nothing is good enough. And so I was taught to always be looking for what was wrong or what was lacking rather than to be appreciating what was there. So it was always, not only was the glass half full, but it was chipped, <laughs> if that makes any sense. You know, it was always sorting for what was wrong. Like what, what isn't good enough in this picture? And what that creates, it is, it is an environment of criticism. And an environment of criticism is an environment that's very stifling. And then what happens is you, you get to a point where you don't even try because you can't do it perfectly. And I had a, um, an Adobe software training center for 18 years. I taught software to adults, <clears throat> creative software like Photoshop and the other Adobe applications to adults. And what I learned about adult learners is that many of them are incredibly timid. And the reason being that as adults, we're not used to having to overcome the bumps and bruises that we get along the way on a learning curve, a new learning something new because we expect to be able to do, to be competent, and we expect to be able to do the things that we're doing. So to learn something new means not knowing, not getting it right. Uh, we could say failing, you know, as we learn, 
and I don't like this notion really of success and failure, but we do have these cultural judgments about what's succeeding and what's failing. And, and in the process of learning, you're doing something not right a lot of the time in order to then self-correct and, and learn to do it more effectively, whatever it is, right? So speaking language, there's, there's a level of frustration when learning something new because you don't have the competency yet. It takes practice to develop something. And adults have lost, in many, many cases, adults have lost the, um, the I don't know if you want to even call it humility or the, the willingness to look bad right um to not be doing something perfectly so we won't we don't try we won't we won't allow ourselves to look stupid in the process of learning something and so this notion of perfectionism like we should be able to do something well on the first try And if we can't, why bother? It's it's kind of it when you can see what a limiting factor it is to the expansion of our experience. You know, as kids, we're we're less um, regulated by that kind of consideration. Kids will try all kinds of crazy things and not have such a um concern for how they look now i know that there are you know in in the mid teens and you know that there is a big consideration for how you look and i i understand that but what i'm what i'm saying is that we are trained into this notion of doing things right doing things well um, and if we don't do something well, then that's a reflection on who we are as human beings or our capacities that we're judged all the time and we're judging ourselves and each other all the time. And that really is the foundation of perfectionism is this judgment. And as we become more forgiving, of ourselves and our collective humanity, I can I, I see where certain perspectives would would say that we reach a place of complacency or we don't have a um, an appreciation for excellence. I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I think that there are times for it's kind of a personal journey now I, I just realized i think for the first time ever as i said the word excellence it has in the word excel you know so we excel in a certain area and even in our excellence even in our excelling it doesn't necessarily mean perfection. So I guess there are times and places for the notion of perfection, um, for the appreciation of perfection. For the most part, I think that when we, when we look at perfectionism, we are locking ourselves into a <clears throat> system of judgment and criticism and sort of a, a hierarchy of um, values 
I think that there is a place for excellence. I mean, we all appreciate excellence, right? But when we're talking about perfectionism, personal perfectionism, in so many ways, it's a recipe for dissatisfaction and, again, paralysis, because we will tend not to even bother to try something because we don't, we, we don't have the assurance that we'll be able to do it perfectly. And so, so much of life is not about like a straight line from here to there, but it's about course correcting. And so we can get from point A to point B, and it may be that we take a winding road there. And at any one moment, we could be evaluating that action toward that intended outcome and criticize it or stop it because it's not perfect. And so as we look at ourselves, if you, like I, are a perfectionist or a recovering perfectionist, you might be looking at yourself and your action in a particular context and be hypercritical of it. And the question is, does that criticism serve you? Is it serving what you're, what you're creating in the world? Is it serving your sense of being and vitality? And how might, how might you better nurture those things that are important. Um, I, I remember I was writing a textbook and I was suffering and struggling so profoundly because I had this idea of how it had to be perfect. And I sweat over it like blood, sweat, and tears over trying to get everything perfect. And of course, there were things that got missed. And there were typos that got missed. And there were errors that occurred. And it was, I was devastated. Uh, I was mortified because I identified with this and I so deeply wanted it to be perfect. I had this image of how it should be. And the thing is that, you know, one typo doesn't invalidate the value of a whole book. I mean, we've all encountered books that have typos in them, especially with these rushes to publication. And so I think that rather than the criticism and judgment inherent in perfectionism, we get to explore forgiveness of ourselves, uh, like allowing space for our humanity, not being sloppy, but, but being able to flow with what is presented rather than living in this this constant judgment of self and others because it's crippling it's crippling and what we want to be able to do is to be expressing and embodying more of life not shutting it down and this notion of particularly doing things perfectly It's a construct. It's a construct that we have created. We are the ones that are saying that's perfect, that's not. And maybe we get to find perfection in the imperfections so that we can find a deeper satisfaction and ease and embracing of the things in life that that 
enliven us, that enrich us, that feed us, and that feed others. And so with that, look at, look at, and maybe allow yourself some freedom from the self-criticism and the self-judgment that comes along with perfectionism because the underlying message is not good enough. Because if you can't achieve that perfection from moment to moment to moment in every moment, then the underlying judgment is not good enough. And maybe we get to make different kinds of, um, maybe we get to create a different context for relating to our way of being in the world that we're we're all finding our way and the the stumbles and skinned knees are part of it and maybe perfection is something that occurs in a moment of grace that we get to enjoy and experience and relish and as we allow ourselves to expand that notion of perfection into the imperfect that um we can find much greater fulfillment and, and satisfaction in life. So Rosalyn says, I'm striving to make the perfect gluten-free vanilla white cake that's moist, going to try adding sour cream. Oh, that's a riot. I love it. And Rosalyn, I hope you'll share your recipe when you get it together. Uh, applesauce might help make it moist too. That's something I've understood around gluten-free as well as almond flour. Just suggestions. Anyway, that's it for today. I'm Mira Rubin. This is The Core Connection. And I go live here each weekday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern on the Enlightened World Network Facebook page and YouTube channel. And it's always such a privilege and pleasure to be having these conversations with you. And I'm so grateful for that. And until next time, so much love to you.